Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Bible study on a chilly November night. Is it the 16th? Is that right? Yeah, it is, too. Um, session 7, we're looking at Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 35, and I'm pretty excited. There's some really interesting stuff in here, as there is every week. Uh, but as we begin, I want to welcome the folks who are joining us from, uh, from elsewhere, from away, in places far and near. Uh, we get uh, wonderful comments from people in many parts of the world about our, our Bible study, which is always interesting to get. Um, and also, um, people who are uh, joining us from elsewhere, if you have any questions to ask, you can uh, send a little note through uh, the lovely Melissa and, uh, on our YouTube channel, and she will pass that up to me by waving frantically from the back as I fail to, uh, to notice. And of course, I encourage everybody here to, uh, to ask questions as we're going through this as well, and please feel free uh, to do so at any time. And so before we begin, are there any questions that uh, have been buzzing around in your head as a result of last week's study that you want to clear up before we go a little further here tonight? Great, there being none, we push on. And so we start in Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. Whenever it mentions the lake, it's the Sea of Galilee. It's the only one there. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Now, that's a, that's a wide area. When uh, they were talking about the ministry of John the Baptist, it mentions that John the Baptist attracted crowds from Judea and as far away as Jerusalem, which is about 40 miles from the area where John was doing the baptisms. But Jesus' popularity is much greater still. It extends throughout the width and the breadth of ancient Israel, which is remarkable when you think of it in a pre-internet age, that this guy was attracting crowds from all over the country. The word was spreading. If you look at a map of that area they're talking about, the print there is pretty small, but at the, at the top you've got Sidon and Tyre, which are in Lebanon uh, on, a, on a modern map. And all the way down to Idumea, which is the bottom of the map, that's actually where King Herod is from. That's his uh, ancestral area below the Dead Sea. Judea, the big province in the middle. And where it says the Decapolis on the side, um, the right-hand side, that's the area where it talks about being across the Jordan. And those are people who um, were not only Jewish, but a, a large Gentile population was beginning to, to follow Jesus as well. The Decapolis, Decapolis means the ten cities or the, tens, the ten towns. And those towns were largely settled as a result of uh, non-Jewish Roman or Greek soldiers uh, being given pieces of land in order to settle. Instead of being paid at the end of a military campaign or military career, they'd be given a, a piece of land. And so that area was settled uh, largely by a non-Jewish population. And we hear about them when we hear about Jesus going to the other side of the lake. And he went to the other side, and we'll come up to uh, some of those stories in chapter 5. But basically, this, this map represents, there's Damascus on the very top right, this map represents the entire more or less populated area of Israel today, as well as Jordan and parts of Syria. So you just, and you know, today Lebanon with Sidon and Tyre. So you can imagine the draw that, uh, that Jesus had. Now, it's not accidental that Mark mentions this, because Mark is, is uh, using Isaiah as sort of his primary reference point for Jesus. If you want to understand Jesus, says Mark, you've got you to read Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And right off the bat in Mark chapter 1, verse 2, he, he says, you know, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Messiah, the Son of God, as Isaiah said. And he goes into it. And he's going to continue on with these Isaiah references, but sometimes he doesn't tell us. We have to figure that out ourselves. And this particular description that Mark gives of the extent of Jesus' popularity and mission can be found in Isaiah 43. And so if you read Isaiah 43 and you have either this map or 
this scripture reading in front of you, you'll see that it's being mentioned for, for quite a specific reason. This is Isaiah 43. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. That's a key chapter from Isaiah, which Jesus is going to be quoting from in, uh, in next week's study as well. And so we'll be looking at that again. But you can see from the, the north, the south, the east, to the west, the sons, the daughters, uh, the, the deaf, the blind, they will all be gathering together to, uh, to hear the good news of God the Savior. So a widespread, a widespread popularity. In, um, we continue with Mark chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples, Jesus told his disciples, to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Now, when we read this, it can sound sort of matter of fact particularly if we read it kind of in a flat way. Uh, I have continued discussions with, uh, with my friend Carla. She uh, went to King's uh, in, um, in Nova Scotia and, you know, Anglican College and went to Anglican services and got used to the Anglican way of reading Scripture. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him, to keep the people from crowding him, for he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. That's how you read it. And you're trained to read it like that because you're not supposed to put your own stuff into the reading. The reading's supposed to speak for itself. But that's not what's happening here at all. What's happening here is a little bit different. It's talking about not only a crowd, but a scary crowd. And crowds can be scary. Last week or two weeks ago now, the chaos at the Houston Music Festival leaves eight dead. Did you see, I'm sure you saw this on the news or read it in the news where this crowd surged forward and people were trampled and, and crushed. I was at uh, a sporting event many years ago where uh, it was a, an NFL game in Buffalo and a fellow fell down. As everybody was leaving, a fellow fell down and it was a bit of a scary moment for that guy because, you know, you've got 50,000 people trying to leave all at once. And, uh, and you can, you know, it's a dangerous thing. A big crowd surging around is a dangerous thing. And although the reading doesn't really point it out to us in this translation, the same danger exists in what's happening with Jesus, so much so that he makes sure to have his back to the lake and a small boat ready to row him to safety. Now, the NIV, the New International Version, which we have here, doesn't give us the intensity with which the passage is written. It isn't just a threat of being crowded. It's a threat of being crushed, and that's the word that's used, that Jesus was concerned about being crushed by the crowd. And the intensity ramps up. Mark writes a very intense passage here. Jesus' reputation as a healer is such that those desperate to be healed, and of course, who wouldn't be desperate you know, to be healed in that era in particular, are pushing forward to touch him, the NIV says. Now, again, the original expression of intensity doesn't come across with pushing forward to touch him. The text literally says, so that those with diseases were falling upon him to touch him. They were surging forward and trying to throw themselves on top of Jesus in this, in this incredible panicked crowd. Uh, you know, very seldom does, does a Bible film represent this very well, and Scripture passages don't either. But Mark is painting a picture of considerable intensity with this crowd. It's not just a matter-of-fact thing. Um, now, Eugene Peterson does a better job in his translation called The Message than the NIV does. 
uh, Jesus went off with his disciples to the sea to get away. But a huge crowd from Galilee trailed after them, also from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, across the Jordan, around Tyre and Sidon, swarms of people who had heard the reports and had come to see for themselves. He told his disciples to get a boat ready so he wouldn't be trampled by the crowd. He had healed many people, and now everyone who had something wrong was pushing and shoving to get near and touch him. That gives you a better sense of what's going on there. We, we have this mental image of, of the New Testament being a very sedate thing until Jesus gets to Jerusalem and gets arrested. and Everybody just sort of wanders around piously, and, you know, it's all very calm and neat and sedate, and, and just, you know, people are holding teacups. And, but that's not what's going on. You need to revise your mental image. These scenes paint a picture that we're not accustomed to, but they do convey a sense of immediacy. You can just imagine Peter you know, anxiously watching these chaotic scenes, fearing for the safety of Jesus in such circumstances. And you can imagine Peter telling that story, Mark recording it. There's so many people there. Jesus was in danger of being crushed. He said, look, boys, get a, get a boat ready in the back. I might have to hightail it out of here. And people with diseases were, were like throwing themselves on top of him. You know, and you get that, that picture. That's a picture you need in your head. And I, I, it says, having a boat to make a quick mistake. It should say quick escape. Having a boat to make a quick escape is a Sea of Galilee version of keep the car running. <laughs> Okay, Peter, start the car, keep it running. Yeah, Lloyd. Did Peter say don't say this or the safety of the crowd? I think Jesus was concerned that because of the, of the uh, intensity of the crowd, he was in danger of being crushed. Yeah. And he uses phrases all the time, like, in order to get away, in order to escape, <laughs> you know. And so it's, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a danger there. And we know that Jesus was subject to, uh, to being able to be harmed. You know, he's not a superhero. Um, he's, he's subject to all the frailties that, that everyone else has. You know, his feet get sore when he walks, and he gets hungry, and, and all those things. And he gets cold. Um, and if a crowd is smashing him up against the side of a house because it's, it's chaos, and people from the back are pushing forward, it's going to be a dangerous time. No, Jesus' stature is not described anywhere, um, unfortunately. Just that it was not remarkable. <laughs> That's about all. What throws you off when you look at old, very, very old paintings of Jesus, none of which were done, of course, from that era, but from a couple of hundred years later, the paintings differ uh, as to where you are. We're used to Jesus, you know, with the beard and so on. We know he had a beard because they pulled on his beard, and so we know he had a beard. Um, we don't know if he had long hair or short hair. We presume short hair because long hair was, was forbidden among uh, Jewish men. Um, but if you look at Greek churches and their early pictures of Jesus in Roman churches, he, he doesn't have a beard because that wasn't the style <laughs> among Roman men. Uh, but in, uh, in other countries, of course, Jesus was pictured with a beard quite appropriately. And so that's the image that we continue to have today. But other than that, we don't know what he looked like. Any questions about any stuff? Any additional questions? Keep the car running. Keep the boat motor going. Adding to the chaos of the crowd, whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You're the Son of God! But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Imagine the scene. Just imagine this scene. And once again, the, the presence of Jesus causes the impure spirits to come to the service, come to the surface. This spell checker is letting me down. And reveal themselves like a powerful medicine forcing illness out of the body or insecticide clearing out a nest. Whenever Jesus gets going, uh, gets into a place, you know, all, all the spiritual uh, earthquake starts happening, and, and these, these spirits come out of the nooks and crannies. When Dana and I lived in Toronto, uh, she was going to George Brown College and I was going to Knox, we lived uh, just south of um, Young and Bloor, right downtown in Toronto, in a, in a building we affectionately called the Roach Motel. And it was, uh, oh, what a 
26-story building or so on the corner of Young and Charles, and just loaded with roaches. And so every year they would do an extermination, and they'd start at the top floor, and they'd fumigate the top floor, and then they'd fumigate the next floor, and they'd fumigate the next floor. Well, we were on the eighth floor, and by the time the fumigators got to the tenth floor, you were walking on a carpet of roaches, <laughs> you know, and you'd open the door and tut, 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 they'd go around. You get used to it. We used to just sing the Cucaracha song, and then we'd be all right. Um, but that's, the, that's kind of the image where Jesus, Jesus is there, and, and these impure spirits, these evil spirits are being shaken out of the, the nooks and the crannies, and just like, a, like if, you, if you, you throw a, a rock at a wasp nest or something. And they're, you know, Jesus, you're the son of God. You know, you're the holy one. Well, Jesus doesn't want that publicity. There are some people who you don't want to sing your praises. You know? um, and so the language that Jesus uses to silence them is, is much stronger than just strict orders. It's actually a sharp, severe rebuke with possibly a suggestion of impending penalty. That's the official phraseology. Um, it's like when my, uh, my mother would say, if I was up to no good, she would say, come here. You know, <laughs> now, nobody in their right mind is going to come here when somebody is already winding up. But it's that kind of, hey, you, you know, that type of thing. Uh, that's the language that's being used. Jesus went up a mountainside. Why? You get away from the crowd. And he called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. So he went up on a mountainside, called to him those he wanted. Well, of course, what's the first question? Which mountainside? <laughs> well, we want to know. You know. We want to know these things. And it's a source of much speculation because the phrase could mean a particular location, a particular mountain, or it could mean going up from the coastline in Capernaum onto what we call the Golan Heights now. And when you're down in the Sea of Galilee, you know, you're surrounded by, by these mountains. Uh, and to get up to the Golan Heights, it's a pretty good climb. Because the water level of the Sea of Galilee, which I've mentioned before is kind of like a bowl, um, is over 200 meters below sea level. And so when you're going down uh, in a, with a car or a bus or something from uh, uh, from the, the heights down into the Sea of Galilee, you, you pass sea level, and you're still way above the Sea of Galilee, and you have to keep going down and going down and going down. You're 200 meters below sea level. Um, and so what mountain could it be? It could be Mount Arbel, for instance, which would be a scenic location overlooking the whole area, but who knows? I'll, I'll show you a picture of that, but you have to get this image in your head. This is the topography of Israel. Now, where it says uh, west, that's the Mediterranean. Okay, so if you're, if you're at the Mediterranean, you have to get over the Carmel range of mountains, and then you go through the Jezreel Valley, and then the peak of the area, the next area is Mount Tabor, and then you go down into that bowl of the Sea of Galilee. Look how low you go. Okay? And then you climb up the Golan Heights. On the other side is Syria, right there. So one of the reasons that storms can be very violent on the Sea of Galilee is that the wind comes from the west, from the Mediterranean, and it whistles along those valleys, and then it, it comes over the Sea of Galilee, and then there's a vacuum because the Sea of Galilee is so low, and so the winds then curl under and spin around like this and churn up. And we'll talk about that a bit more when we look at Jesus and the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And so, where could Jesus have called those disciples? Well, maybe Mount Arbel, that, that, that high peak right there, which is the, the high point looking down into the Sea of Galilee. That high point is sea level. <laughs> okay, so it gives you an idea of how, how low you go. So it could be Mount, uh, Mount Arbel. This is what it looks like. Um, I've got a, uh, a lovely lady there for scale. And that's what it looks like when you're on top of Mount Arbel, looking down into the Sea of Galilee. And I'll have a more detailed picture to show you um, in a little while as well. So it could be that. Um, it could be the Mount of Transfiguration, 
where it says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. It kind of makes sense to me that the same mountain that he called the disciples to would be the Mount of Transfiguration as well. But we don't know where the Mount of Transfiguration is. Some have speculated that it is Mount Tabor. But Mount Tabor is about 50 kilometers from the Sea of Galilee. You have to go kind of south. And so that would be a bit of a stretch uh, from that area. This is what Mount Tabor uh, looks like. There's a little village on the, on the bottom that is populated uh, by the people who drive you in taxis up to the top. Um, and it's sort of a you know, big flat plain of Jezreel in front of you, and then this, this lump of Mount Tabor. And it's really funny reading the ancient rabbis on this because they describe Mount Tabor in two ways. First of all, they say um, you have the flat plain of Jezreel and then Mount Tabor is like an outy belly button. <laughs> and so, I, okay, um, I don't know. And then other rabbis, like Maimonides, for instance, writes that, and rising gently uh, up from the, from the plain uh, of the Valley of Jezreel is Mount Tabor, uh, rising, rising like a young woman's breast. And it makes me think, yeah, Maimonides was a lonely guy. He lived a lonely life. And um, okay, fine. He, uh, he obviously had a great affection for Mount Tabor. But anyway, this is uh, one of the traditional locations that people think of as the Mount of Transfiguration. There are reasons it could be, reasons that perhaps not. Or it, Jesus could be calling the disciples to the mountain of uh, this post-resurrection meeting place. After the resurrection, we read in Matthew, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So it makes sense to me. That would be the same mountain where he commissioned them as the apostles. But we're not told which mountain that could be either. So if I uh, have the opportunity in, in the future years to bring you to Israel, you'll say, which mountain? I'll say, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> could be this, could be that, could be that. We read that he called to him those he wanted. Now, that's an important distinction. We get the idea that there's 12 guys following Jesus and that's it. But as we see, there's these vast crowds following Jesus. But there's 12 that he picks out from the crowd, 12 that he calls specifically to a task, particularly in mind for apostolic ministry, those who would spend time closely with him and also go out into the world representing Jesus, equipped with both the message he gave them and the power that he shared with them. And this is an aspect of the calling of the apostles that I really want to point out. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. That's an important aspect of it. These are the guys who are going to hang around Jesus. They're going to be with him that time. And that he might send them out to preach. But first thing you got to do is be with Jesus. Now you compare this when, when they're having to replace Judas, who had uh, sadly hanged himself, and uh, replace him to get up to the number of 12 again. Peter says this is what's necessary for an apostle. It is necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. That's what you got to be to be an apostle. You have to be somebody who was with Jesus throughout the entire course of his ministry and a witness to the resurrection. Now, you notice Peter also says it is necessary to choose one of the men who has been... Why, why not one of the women? Because we know that there were women following Jesus around since the very beginning. And some women had a very important role. And, you know, the first uh, people to see the resurrected Jesus were women. They told the apostles uh, the good news and so on. Uh, we also know that the apostle Paul refers to at least one woman called Junia as among the apostles, uh, as counted as among the apostles. But in those days, you just couldn't get away with a woman being in a position of authority, bringing a message from place to place. She didn't have the cultural authority or respect to be able to do that. And so uh, 
It was limited to men, but we know that women played a very, very active role uh, in the church as well, even in many roles of leadership and teaching. Anything about that or anything else? I mean, let me get away with the woman thing here pretty easily. It's not my fault. He also gave them authority to drive out demons. Now, the conflicts that are regularly arising with demonic powers, they'd be a threat to the apostles. Remember the, the roach illustration, right? They're, the exterminators on, are on the ninth floor, and the apostles are, are being sent out on floor number eight, so they're going to be running into uh, these problems. But they're given power to counter these forces. But that power isn't always enough. We'll come upon this in our study in chapter 9. Um, but what happens is uh, James, John, and Peter come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and there's a big hubbub going on. Well, what's happening? Well, there's a man whose uh, son is being plagued by an evil spirit. And the man says, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Why not? Well, after Jesus had gone indoors, Jesus takes care of the situation, and then they go away from it. It says, after Jesus had gone indoors, the disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And Jesus replies, somewhat mysteriously, this kind can come out only by prayer. So, what does that mean? Because we're not told that Jesus had a big time of prayer before healing this boy. All we're told is that Jesus commanded the Spirit to come out, the Spirit comes out. But the authority that Jesus has seems to be of a different quality than the authority that he was able to pass on to the apostles, who themselves were burdened with fear and doubt and, and trepidation, as you would be in the midst of that situation. So they have the authority, but not always the spiritual maturity to be able to exercise that authority. Not yet. After the resurrection, it becomes a different thing. So, the twelve, the huge multitude that's following Jesus is thinned down as Jesus invites those he wanted to come with him. So there's a distinction there between those who, who follow after him, you know, desperately seeking healing, or, or those who are only caught up in, this, in all these strange things that are going on, you know, let's follow this guy, see what happens. But well, there's, there's this much, much smaller group who are summoned to follow after him as disciples with a particular task. And how many are there? There are 12. And 12 is a number with great symbolic significance in Israel because it points to the restoration of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus stands over them as leader. So you've got 12 apostles, you've got 12 tribes. This is the new formation of Israel coming to bear. So the, the 12 tribes, back in Genesis, for those who were following our Genesis study, we, we, we learned about these sons of Jacob. Levi, Simeon, Reuben, Judah, Joseph, Benjamin, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, and Issachar. And these 12 tribes comprise all of the nation of Israel. Now, Sadly, when the northern part of Israel was, uh, was conquered by the Assyrians in about 700 years before Jesus, uh, that area which was populated by 10 of those 12 tribes was largely dissipated and those genealogies were largely lost. In the south, which, which uh, carried on for an additional 200 years, uh, the tribes of uh, Benjamin and Judah uh, carried on. And so people were still able to trace their genealogies to those. And so in, uh, in Ju Judea is the, the area that Jerusalem is in. And Judea comes from the word Judah. And the word Jew or Jewish comes from Judea and Judah. It became sort of the short form. It's the Ju Ju Judea was the name of the Roman province uh, where Jerusalem is. And... Uh, and Jews became sort of a short name for the Hebrew people or the Israelite people. Yes? Yes. Yes. 
That's right. They, when, Judas, when Judas was gone, as you quite, uh, quite gently said, um, yeah, there's only 11 apostles left. So Peter says, hey, we've got to make up number 12 here again. Uh, but we don't, we don't know whether or not they did that again. So another disciple, James, uh, James is, or another apostle, James, is killed within the context of the book of Acts, within the timing of the book of Acts. But when James is killed, we're not told that he was replaced by somebody else appointed to the task. He may have been, but we weren't told. The one we are told about is the replacement of the original gang. So, Mark 3, 16 to 19 gives us the helpful list. He says, these are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, who's also sometimes called Cephas, just to confuse you further. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom Jesus gave the nickname Boanerge, which means the sons of thunder. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well, not in this study, but in a later chapter. Why this nickname? It was Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Mark's already giving away uh, the end of the story. He's not leaving us in suspense. But can you imagine somebody who doesn't know the story of the Gospels at all, and they're reading this for the first time, and here's the 12 he appointed. Oh, oh, okay, this guy, this guy. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. What? <laughs> what do you mean? We know the story, so we're not surprised. But imagine somebody hearing the, reading this for the first time. Why did he pick somebody who betrayed him? Well, you're going to have to read more of the gospel to find that out. That's sort of Mark dangling that thing in front of you. So why that order, the order that's given, it seems to be an order of apostolic authority with the inner circle of Simon Peter, who's the de facto leader, James and John, that inner circle of three, followed by the rest, maybe in order of their calling. Because <coughs> when you're reading that, I'm just cough right into my microphone, sorry didn't help. When you're reading the, the list of the apostles and you compare it to when they were called, it seems to be the order in which they were called after the original three um, insider insiders. Um, Judas always brings up the rear. Whenever in the Gospels we read a list of the apostles, Judas is always the last, and he's always listed uh, as the traitor or the betrayer or the guy who was a thief. Um, not surprisingly, he's not regarded with an awful lot of affection by the writers of the New Testament. When you read other Gospels and compare this list of disciples to other lists of disciples, you'll find that they differ slightly because sometimes they're using their first name, sometimes they're using their last name, sometimes they're using their Roman name. It looks like Peter. Peter, Simon, Cephas, same guy. And so that can mix you up sometimes if you're comparing apostolic lists. Questions? Yes, Gary. So why was Judas in the select 12? Didn't Jesus have kind of a big picture overview of what was going to happen? And the answer seems to be because this had to happen this way. And uh, when Judas is um, about to go out and betray Jesus, uh, Jesus said to him, do what you must do. Go and do what you must do. So I guess it's all part of the plan, even though it's a pretty, pretty hard plan. But nonetheless, the disciples, again, the other apostles have no sympathy for Judas whatsoever in their descriptions of him. So, Mark 3, 20. Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. So again, just like, imagine that crowd. They, they get into a house trying to get away, and a crowd gathered. Now, what house? Well, we don't, we don't know. Get used to me saying, we don't know. 
We're uncertain where this is or whose house it is. Now, given the presence in, later on in this story that his family is part of this as well, it's possible that following the appointment of the apostles and given the chaotic crowd scenes in Capernaum, that Jesus has taken the guys and withdrawn to Nazareth. Maybe the mountain that he called them to is one of those mountains in the range between Capernaum and Nazareth. A house, when it says here, Jesus entered a house, uh, is translated by some as, as home, that he enters a, his home. Now, as it's common in Mark's gospel, Peter, as often points out, there's not room or opportunity to eat. Peter liked, liked to have a meal when he was supposed to have a meal. And if you ever read a passage that says, if somebody says, guess which gospel this is from? It says, it was so crowded, there wasn't even time or room to eat. So, oh, that's gospel of Mark. Easy. About six or seven times, Peter points out grumpily <laughs> that there wasn't even time to eat. The other gospels don't put that detail in there. But for Peter, it's a big one. Write that down, Mark. We didn't even get to eat. <laughs> that's how crowded it was. Uh, so, Nazareth to Capernaum, it's a bit of a walk. They have developed something now called the Jesus Trail, and it's one of my goals in the future to, to walk this trail. It's about uh, 40 miles, so a good, good solid two-day two -day walk. And you can go from Nazareth all the way up to the top of the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. And there are various rest stops along the way and places that you can stay and, and all the rest of it. But uh, that's, a, that's a good 40-mile walk. So remember when, we, when I said, you know, it's possible that Mount Tabor, the outy belly button, uh, was a possibility for where Jesus gathered those apostles together? Now, Mount Tabor, I don't know if you can make that out at all. It's kind of near the center and the bottom. There's some writing here that actually says Mount Tabor. So if they would have gone down to Mount Tabor, you can see how it's quick over to Nazareth from there. It's only about six, seven miles from Nazareth. And so it's possible that that's, that makes Tabor look pretty good. But anyway, I think they're probably in Nazareth here because his family suddenly enters the story. And they're not from Capernaum. They're from Nazareth. Okay. So the scriptures say, Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And then when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. Uh, our, uh, our student minister, Will, uh, preached a little bit about this uh, passage a few, uh, a few weeks or months ago now. Uh, but it's, it's a surprising passage. Again, perhaps Jesus and the apostles are in Nazareth, and despite escaping Capernaum, of course, they're beginning to attract a crowd so that he can't even get a bite to eat. And there's sufficient commotion made that his family is alerted. Again, this really sounds like Nazareth to me. And they decide to take charge of him, or literally take hold of him. The, the context of the, of the passage is they were going to grab onto him and drag him away um, because they, think, you know, they fear that he's out of his mind and that he'll bring danger to himself or irreparable harm to the reputation of of the entire family in this small town of Nazareth. Now, that's a lot to try to swallow because there's some big questions that come out of Jesus' family thinking he's out of his mind. It's not like my family thinking I'm out of my mind. I'm used to that, and they've always thought I was out of my mind. But you'd assume that Jesus' family would have an inside view and be very respectful and all the rest of it. So how could his family think he's out of his mind? Particularly Mary. Changes the whole Christmas story altogether, doesn't it? We immediately assume that Mary is part of that evaluation. Boys, go get your brother. He's crazy. You know? But that's not what it says. Perhaps it's only his brothers who make this judgment. Joseph is out of the picture by this point. He's almost certainly having predeceased Mary, Jesus' stepdad. Joseph, but, but, but how does this come to be? How is it that 
in the Gospel of John, the brothers of Jesus are described as not believing in him. John 7, 5 is pretty clear. It says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Now, how is, how is this possible? Surely growing up with this guy, being told by Mary and by Joseph, hey, hey, don't, don't hit Jesus. He's the Son of God. You know, you, you'd think there would be something like this. But who, who are these brothers? Well, Mark is going to identify them for us in chapter 6 when Jesus has another debut in Nazareth when he's actually invited to speak in the synagogue, we read this. Is the, the crowd says, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? It seems as though Jesus has pretty extensive family after all, four brothers and an unnamed number of sisters. But are these siblings or are they step-siblings? Or are they a mixture of both? And we don't know anything about Jesus' sisters other than there they are. But, but what of these brothers? Where do, where do uh, James and Joseph and Judas and Simon come from, and why don't they believe in Jesus? Well, one possible answer is that it all goes back to Joseph. In very ancient Orthodox and Roman Catholic tradition, the brothers of Jesus are from a previous marriage of Joseph and an unnamed wife who died. Okay, so Joseph was married previously, had a number of kids, four sons, who knows how many daughters, and God bless her, his good wife passed away. Mary would then be brought in as a second wife and a stepmother to his children who were of indeterminate age. Maybe they were 15, 16 you know, a range in, in there by the time Joseph marries Mary and Jesus is born. They would have been of a sufficient age to not accompany Mary and Joseph to their time in Egypt. Remember, after Jesus is born, Mary and Joseph from Bethlehem, angel says to Joseph, hey, get on your bike because Herod's soldiers are coming to get you. And so they go to Egypt. But no, no brothers are mentioned. So if they were old enough not to be part of that and not to be traveling with Joseph down to Bethlehem for the census and all the rest of it, maybe they had already kind of established themselves up in Nazareth as a separate family unit and grew even further apart during the three years or even five years that Joseph and Mary were in Egypt. So their relationship with Jesus would have been somewhat removed as a result. That might explain why his brothers say, well, this is Jesus, you know, this is from dad's second at Mary, we don't really know anything about them. I don't know. On the other hand, it's possible that these brothers and sisters were born to Mary and Joseph with Jesus as the eldest child. It's also possible that these brothers and sisters are not immediate siblings, but the children of Joseph and Mary's extended family. Because that kind of distinction, you know, stepbrothers or cousins are often just named as immediate family. But the text does say brothers and sisters. And other sections of Scripture are quite specific about referring to Jesus' brothers, not cousins, brothers. For instance, in Acts 1.14, after the resurrection, we read this joyous passage. They all join together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So after the resurrection, these guys become part of the family of faith. It doesn't mention the sisters, but hopefully they're in that gang as well. The Apostle Paul, when he's talking about his visit to Jerusalem, he says, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. Paul's very specific about James being Jesus' brother. So who are these people? What happened to them? Well, according to the Gospels, Jesus had several brothers and sisters, but James and Jude are the only ones mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. James as the, becomes the leader of the early church in Jerusalem, and Jude we know about only because of the very short and somewhat strange letter in the New Testament called the Book of Jude or the Letter of Jude. What about the other guys? What about Simon and Joseph? <clears throat> we don't know anything. But in ancient tradition, preserved by our, our friend Eusebius, that early church historian writing in the three, early 300s, states that, that
that Simon, Jesus' brother Simon, not Simon Peter, he said Jesus' brother Simon, later became the bishop of the church in Jerusalem, and he was finally crucified in the Roman persecutions under the emperor Trajan. So it's possible that Jesus' brother Simon took over the leadership of the Jerusalem church after Jesus' brother James, who was leader of the Jerusalem church, was killed. What about the other children? Well, there's a really neat passage in Eusebius. And friends, pay attention, because you're not going to get this anywhere else. I, I challenge you to get this information anywhere else. Eusebius writes not about the brothers of Jesus, but about the nephews of Jesus, and even the great nephews of Jesus. So the, the family line is continuing here. For us, it all kind of stops at the end of the New Testament, but no, the, what, things continue. Eusebius writes, there still survived of the kindred of the Lord, so the immediate family of Jesus, the grandsons of Jude, so the grandnephews of Jesus. Jude, who according to the flesh was called his brother. These were informed against as belonging to the family of David, and Evocatus brought them before Domitian Caesar. So what happened was somebody informed against them, hey, these guys are part of the tribe of David, they're Jews, but they're these Christians with these messianic ideas that David's going to be the new king. So they inform the authorities on these people. And so they're brought before Caesar, and Caesar asked them what property they had or how much money they possessed. They both replied that they had only 9,000 denarii between them, each of them owning half that sum. But even this, they said, they did not possess in cash, but as the estimated value of some land, and that they supported themselves by their own labor. So these aren't wealthy people. These are small plot farmers with not a dollar in their pocket, and their entire fortune is wrapped up in their land. And it says this, And then they began to hold out their hands, exhibiting as proof of their manual labor the roughness of their skin and the corns raised on their hands by constant work. Thereupon Domitian passed no condemnation upon them, but treated them with contempt as too mean or unimportant for notice, and he let them go free. So, what's interesting about this? Well, by the time we're dealing with the grandchildren of Jesus' brothers, or the great-grandchildren uh, of Joseph and Mary, there's just a couple of them left. Everybody else has died. The family has been winnowed down to just these two. And they're poor farmers who say, you know, look, we, we work. We don't have money. We work for a living. Look at our hands. And Domitian says, you guys are not important at all. And he just sends them away. So counter this with uh, stuff you read in books like The Da Vinci Code where Jesus founds a line of French kings which go on, and there's this royalty, and everybody's covered in jewels and gold. You know? No, no. By the time the Domitian, so we're talking about, say, 110 A.D., 100 to 110 A.D., by the time Domitian's there, the whole family's died out, and the ones that are left are poor. So that's a really, I think, a, an important insight that... One of the things, one of the criticisms of, of the Gospels is, oh, these things didn't happen. The disciples and, and so on made all these things up for their own importance and their own wealth. Well, this is what it came down to. If that was their plan, it didn't work out very well because there's only two of the initial family of Jesus left and they don't have enough money for a cab ride home. So. Any questions? Isn't that interesting? Who's heard this before? Nobody. <laughs> I'm asking on anybody out there in TV land. This is just fascinating stuff. If I do say so myself. Okay, so the family is there. Everybody's in Nazareth. Crowd in the house. Family says, ah, golly, we better get a hold of him because he's, he's out of his mind. Let's get him out of here. It's going to cause trouble. And then we read, the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Okay, so not only is he crazy, says his family, the religious authorities say he's the biggest demon of them all. 
And that's why he's able to cast out these demons. Beelzebul. Uh, Beelzebub is an alternate spelling. It's a version of the name of a Philistine deity, mockingly described as the Lord of the Flies. Now, we know that phrase, Lord of the Flies, from that horrible, 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 horrible book that we had to read in high school and nightmares about. But Beelzebub, so Lord of the Flies is sort of a slur. Oh, yeah, that's, he's very, very important. He's the god of all the flies. You know, it's a slur. It's a nickname. But here he's identified as the prince of the demons. Now, there was a book called The Testament of Solomon, which was an extremely odd book, a time shortly before Jesus, written about 150 years or so before Jesus. Nobody ever recognized it as scripture, but it was a popular-selling novel uh, and it was sort of a manual for exorcists. And it talks about various names of various demons and angels and such and how to go about uh, getting rid of them. Uh, and so that's where this Beelzebub comes from. And they're saying, hey, the reason this guy's good at casting out demons is because he's just a more important demon than they are, and so he can tell them to get lost, and they will. So he's being accused of being crazy. He's being accused of being a prince of demons. And so Jesus calls these religious authorities over to him, and he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. And so he's saying, that's... Why would, if I was an important demon working for Satan, why would I be getting rid of all of his helpers? And it doesn't make any sense, says Jesus. So the teachers of the law are kind of mudslinging, seeing what would stick. And they may have concluded that somebody who flouts hallowed traditions and doesn't bow to their authority could only be an undercover agent for Satan. On the other hand, they may be trying to undermine Jesus by giving him this reputation as, oh, he's actually of the devil. Jesus simply replies, it doesn't make any sense. Why would the devil fight the devil? And then Jesus says something which has caused people lots of worry and concern over the years. Jesus says, and he's talking to these teachers, he says, truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Now, that's pretty worrisome. I'm sure you've heard of the unforgivable sin. And in my pastoral ministry of some 35, 36 years, I have had numerous people come to me very concerned that something that they've done in their life is somehow this unforgivable sin. What is? Can Jesus forget everything? What, what is the unforgivable sin? Well, what Jesus is doing here is warning them against blaspheming the Spirit, which means attributing the words and the deeds and the person and ministry of Jesus to an evil source, thereby cutting a person off from that source of forgiveness and from the kingdom of God. So if someone is insisting, oh, Jesus is a fake, he himself is a devil, the whole thing is, is just, it's an evil thing, there's, there's no truth to it whatsoever, they're cutting themselves off from the channel of forgiveness. It's like if you're in a deep pit and there's a ladder going up, and the only way out of the pit is the ladder, and you say, I'm not going up that thing, forget it, forget it. That's not a real ladder, it's not a secure ladder, it's not a safe ladder, it's, it's not even a ladder at all, it's just, it's an, I don't believe that ladder, I'm not going to climb up that ladder. Well, you've relegated yourself to the pit. <laughs> it's the choice that you've made regarding Jesus as demonic or as of evil sources cuts you off from the channel of forgiveness that is open to you. So how do you cut yourself off from Jesus? By cutting yourself off from Jesus. Now, C.S. Lewis was, is helpful to me in this. He used the example of the unopenable door of hell, which is locked from the inside. 
and therefore unopenable by those who refuse to unlock it and gain freedom. That is to say, C.S. Lewis's great illustration, the door is, people, the door is locked. People are in hell, the door is locked. But it's locked from the inside, not from the outside. You want to get out, they can unlock it <laughs> and leave. But you refuse. You refuse to leave and to enter God's grace and forgiveness. That's how Lewis very helpfully illustrated this. It's a big subject. But again, if you're worried, have I committed the unforgivable sin? My response would be, do you regard Jesus as having come from the devil? Well, no. Well, no, then you haven't. And if you once at one point in your life did and changed your mind, <laughs> then you haven't. Right? You're accessing that ladder. You're unlocking the door. Actually, Lyle asked a question first, and over to John. Yeah, it's my fault. Yeah. So then a few verses later, they got him as a demon. Yeah, the, uh, Jesus is rubbing the, official, the temple officials and the priests the wrong way. For one reason, he's drawing big crowds. They're not. Um, and they're resenting his popularity. They're afraid of his popularity. And so they're the ones who are coming and saying, hey, everybody, don't, make, don't believe this guy. He's actually from the devil. All you crowds go away. John? We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, we do. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah, what about the people who think that Jesus isn't necessarily the Son of God, but he's a nice guy? I think what these guys are doing is a little bit stronger than that. Um, what these guys are doing is saying he's possessed by the devil, he's the prince of demons. That's a bit stronger than saying he's just a nice guy. Um, and we'll get into Jesus dealing with people who are not hugely antagonistic, but who are doubting him. We'll get into them in, another, in a later thing. I don't want to give away all my best material. Uh, it's just too early. So what happens? Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. They can't get in, right? It's all crowded. So there's a mother and brothers, you know, looking. Uh, who? Maybe Mary was saying, now boys, boys, <laughs> don't be rough on, don't be too hard on him. You know? A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, hey, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. It's quite something. The gang's all here, including the sisters. Some manuscripts have only your mother and your brothers. Others have your mother, your sister, and your brothers. Intending to bodily remove him from the situation. Instead, they're not even able to get close to him. They can't penetrate the crowd. They have to send somebody else in. Go get Jesus for us, will you? Tell him, tell him his family's here. Tell him his mother and brothers are here. And then Jesus says, who are my mother and brothers? Now, we don't feel the same level of shock and surprise as a Middle Eastern audience in which family was absolutely everything. When Jesus would have said this, who are my mother and brothers? Everybody would have gone, oh, did, you, did you hear what he just said? Who are my... Who are my mother and brother? It, it's incredible in, in a Middle Eastern culture like that to deny your family, to just question your family is, is, is unbelievable, unbelievable. <coughs> and what Jesus does in a stunning move, he redefines family as those who are united in the common cause of God. In the same way, Christians are dual citizens we're citizens of an earthly realm and a heavenly kingdom. We also have two families. We have our biological family, and we have our faith family, with God as father and Jesus as brother. 
That's how Jesus redefines family for us. And think of what an incredible honor that is to be called part of the family of God. We sing the song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. But that's a tremendous, tremendous truth and an amazing view of reality. We need to sing that song with stunned amazement. I'm a part of the family of God? It's, it's an incredible honor. Even more revolutionary is the dangerous idea that for Christians, citizenship in the kingdom of heaven demands primary loyalty over that of earthly citizenship. Likewise, participation in the family of faith is of greater priority than biological allegiance. So what does it mean that the kingdom of heaven demands primary loyalty over that of earthly citizenship? If your government tells you to do something which is contrary to what Jesus tells you to do, as a Christian, you don't do it. This was a big, big issue when the government was saying you have to sacrifice the emperor and recognize the emperor as God or we're going to take your job or take your house or put you in jail or throw you to the lions or just cut off your head right now. These were big issues. For us, it's, we can't, oh, well, you know, our government would never ask us to do anything contrary to the gospel. Um, but what is our primary allegiance? Likewise, participation in the family of faith is of greater priority than biological allegiance. This is our first call. Who are my mother and brother, says Jesus? Whoever does the will of God, that's my family. And Jen, Jesus says one of the hardest things he'll ever say. And he says this, and he exaggerates for emphasis. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. He's exaggerating for emphasis. Okay? This does not mean you should hate your family. This means that your primary allegiance is to the family of faith. That was, those are hard words, but they're ones which were very, very important and Jesus says in other places, look, you know, some of you are going to have a divided family because of your faith. You know, it's going to be, some of you will believe and some of you won't, and as a result, your families are going to split apart. It's going to be hard, says Jesus. Following me is hard. And when he says this to the disciples, he says, unless you're prepared to give up all of those ties, can you really follow me? And Peter says, hey, we've given all that up. What are we going to get? <laughs> you know, which is another good question for us. So, those are hard words. We never do know whether or not Mary and the brothers got to drag Jesus bodily out and, uh, and hide him in the, in the other home for a while or not. Um, but Jesus does come back to Nazareth. And as we saw in the book of Acts, he is ultimately reconciled to his whole family uh, as well. Even the brothers, all the way down to the great uh, grandchildren of his brothers. Any questions? Yes, Melissa. From Brazil. There you go. Even in Brazil, they haven't heard of this. So there you go. Thank you very much from, uh, from Brazil. Greetings to our friends in Brazil and Iran and Mexico and across Canada and many parts in the States and in London and a couple of other countries which I forget that are writing us. So, God bless you all. Next week we look at Mark chapter 4. Let's close with a prayer. Dear God, families are not always easy. Sometimes they're hard, particularly when we misunderstand one another or when our allegiance is divided. We pray, Lord God, that we will live our lives in such a way that we will shine brightly in the midst of our family and that our families can come to recognize you as their Savior and Lord, and will be able to call you brother and call God Father. And for this we thank you in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. See you next week for chapter 4. Tip your waiter.
Oh, no, Lyle, it's, it's not confusing at all. 